we can begin with Roland Thaxter. He was uh, on the faculty here uh, in 1905, and uh, he had a specialty, and one of his specialties was to look at the fungi, that, a particular group of fungi that occur on insects. And part of what he was doing was going to collect those insects and look for the fungi. He was also kind of sent on a mission by W.G. Farlow, who was the founder of this institution, to collect seaweeds. And then he did the general collecting. So when he took off from here, he was really pretty much uh, had himself prepared for uh, a year in the field. And the way you got there in 1905, uh, you know, we, we can get anywhere in the world in 24 hours these days, but that's not how it worked then. And so uh, the route was from uh, North America to Liverpool and England and then across the Atlantic with stops in the Azores and so forth. And he ended up in Buenos Aires, where he had contact with a mycologist, Carlos Spagazzini. And uh, Spagazzini was the kind of reigning botanist of South America, had published uh, quite a lot. So he spent time there mostly collecting insects and working with Spagazzini, who was doing some of the same work. Uh, he then took a ship, I think it was three weeks to get to uh, southern, to get to South America, to get to Buenos Aires. And then he took a ship, went around to uh, Punta Arenas in uh, southern Chile. And one of the interesting things about Punta Arenas that I didn't realize until I began doing this work is that it was a relatively young town in 1905. Uh, had been established about 50 years before. So it was a fledgling kind of place. An important stopover because of the, uh, the trans-oceanic uh, 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 because of the uh, need to get from the Atlantic to the Pacific before the Panama Canal was there. So a stop off for provisioning uh, and coal and so forth. Thaxter stopped off there and then continued up the coast of Chile to Valparaiso on to Santiago. And he spent about uh, Three, three months in that part of northern Chile, Concepcion. He spent a lot of time there. Uh, he then went back to Punta Arenas. Now, so far as my collecting and my focus, it's been largely Punta Arenas and then this area a little bit further north in the lakes area uh, that he didn't collect or he didn't uh, collect extensively. Uh, so, again, going back to these locations where he collected, uh, probably it's uh, more accessible in these southern parts of Chile than the, the northern areas where he collected. Uh, but we were able to go back to many of these same spots. Uh, Thaxter spent three months in Punta Arenas, then went back to Argentina, his plan was to go on to Brazil and get into tropical South America. He didn't do that because uh, he was called home. Uh, his oldest son was uh, seriously ill and he had to get home. But it, getting home was not 24 hours on the plane. It was cross the Atlantic to England, cross back over to, uh, to Boston. So not, not an easy trip. And, uh, but he, uh, he wrote about his trip. There's a couple publications that deal with it. His insect collections uh, from those trips and the fungi on them were worked up much more extensively than the, the other collections. So we, we can go downstairs, we can find the collections that he made in 1905, 1906 and work through them, as well as looking at the, the ones that we, we got from the same locations. As we know, so long and so narrow, it's uh, pushed up against the sea in the 
the mountains, and this gives it a, a tremendous uh, variation in climate and in vegetational patterns. And uh, so when one begins to look at this and think about the, the organisms that are there, uh, it's a tremendous range of different kinds of habitats that they can inhabit. So when I talk about the North of Vegas forests, that's really kind of central and south uh, in Chile. And that's primarily where we've worked. And many of those climates are kind of Mediterranean. And uh, I, there, there were places where uh, I would visit and you'd look at the landscape because of the introduced pines from California. You would look out and think, I could be in California here. Um, but indeed, uh, it's a very similar kind of, uh, kind of climatic zone and the organisms are uh, somewhat similar. Uh, but the big similarities that we found in southern Chile with the fungi is that the closest relatives are likely to be in Australia and in New Zealand. And this has to do with a, uh, the geology of the Earth, uh, where these continents that we look at now uh, were once connected. And uh, the vegetation, the animals, the plants had an origin in this uh, supercontinent of uh, Gondwana land. Uh, and as Gondwana land began to break apart, uh, then uh, elements of that flora and fauna and uh, the fungus component as well uh, remained there. But as we looked at some of our um, materials that we collected and looked at the phylogenies and the uh, genetics, we could say that uh, a particular fungus in southern South America was much more closely related to a fungus in Australia than to either the rest of South America or North America. And that has to do with this long geographical, uh, connect, uh, ancient geographical connection. Um, so uh, we talked a little bit about the Ceteria and Nothophagus, part of those continents that were, we well, uh, Gondwana uh, included South, South America, Australia, uh, South Africa, and Antarctica. And when we begin to look at the distribution of some of the plants, we can reconstruct those distributions by looking, in the case of Nothophagus, at the pollen record. And uh, we can see distinctive types of pollen throughout the the deposits across these continents. And uh, we know that Antarctica at one point had Nothophagus growing in it, different position, different areas, but Nothophagus and this connection that we see is an ancient connection that had, uh, that existed because of the proximity of these continents at one time. So is, did Gondwana break off of Pangaea? Pangaea, yeah, Pangaea is the big continent, and uh, the southern part of that was Gondwana, Gondwana land. We found new and uh, undescribed species from Chile, but uh, we've only published a few of these. Uh, many studies are still ongoing. Uh, we will continue with these. I plan to return to uh, Chile and uh, recollect some of the materials that we've uh, begun with and that we're working on. One of the things that we're uh, doing right now is that uh, with a postdoc here, uh, we're looking at some of the collections that we made before, comparing them with uh, collections of what have been called the same species around the world, but which we suspect are not, uh, that are different. So it's fairly painstaking and it involves uh, morphology, being able to look at these and do measurements and see what they look like under the microscope. And then it's also using multiple genes to analyze the 
uh, genealogies, essentially, of what the connections are with these. So we're, it's ongoing. Uh, we have every expectation that there are going to be uh, a number of new and different things that come from these studies. One of the things that I, I think is so um, amazing about doing field work in Chile is that almost everyone that you encounter, whether it's at a park or at a restaurant or on the street, uh, that they're interested in what you're doing and you tell them that you're uh, interested in studying fungi. And uh, many of them will have a story. They'll have a story about what is, uh, some fungus they ate, or they'll have a question about, what is that fungus on the, the tree over there? Uh, and so th my impression has been that they're uh, very much uh, connected with the natural world around them, uh, that they, uh, people have curiosity about the, that world and about the uh, fungi that they see. Um, there's also a culture in southern Chile, uh, particularly of using the uh, fungal products. So I'd mentioned this genus Ceteria uh, that grows on trees. Uh, it forms a gall-like structure on the tree, so the tree becomes quite malformed. And then there are these golf ball-like uh, fruiting bodies on the tree, and the, the fruiting bodies are eaten uh, traditionally, they're used in a fermented uh, beverage, and the wood that's all gnarled is used to make furniture or bowls or other uh, items. And so uh, th there is this kind of curiosity because in many places people are closely connected with uh, these products, the, uh, the fungus itself or the wood that's been infected. What I study are these cup fungi. They produce their spores in little sacs. Uh, they're called ascomycetes or ascomycota. Uh, the ones that people may be familiar with are the morels, uh, which are edible. And related to all of these are also the truffles, these underground uh, fungi. And uh, Matt Smith is particularly interested in these underground fungi, the truffles, and the truffle-like fungi. These are also mycorrhizal. And an emphasis for us in these trips has been to look for these uh, fungi, which haven't been well collected at all, because they're not out on the surface, they're down in the, in the soil. Uh, and it takes some special looking to be able to find them. Uh, but uh, the morel is a good example of, of one of these cup fungi. Uh, it's also a good example of uh, some issues in Chile about uh, fungi and fungal harvests. Um, the morels are thought to fruit much more frequently when there's been a burn, so a forest fire will stimulate the burn. One of the things that is uh, uh, problematic, these are important fungi for commerce. They're collected and uh, many times uh, dried and sent overseas and so forth. But uh, because they're economically important, there is a kind of motivation to find the places where these occur. And you can make the place be more fruitful by burning the forests. And this is one of the big conservation issues in uh, southern Chile in particular, is the damage to forests through uh, mushroom collecting. In terms of Chile, there are um, very few mycologists. There have been very few detailed studies of these organisms, and so the chance of going and finding things and picking up things that haven't been well studied is very, very great. I, I should say as well that Chile is the only country in the world that has legislation that includes fungi in looking at and trying to evaluate a site for uh, development or construction. So uh, in many parts of the world, the plants are considered so if there's rare and endangered plants on a site, the, the site may not be uh, developed. Uh, but fungi have never been considered, uh, along with these, as uh, environmental parameters for development. 
And Chile is unique in that they have done this protection and used fungi to evaluate sites and uh, look at development uh, potentials. I had read the, the diary the, of uh, Roland Thaxter and he had fallen in love with Punto Arenas in a way. He uh, said that it was the most uh, productive and the, the best place that he had ever spent in South America. And so uh, when I began reading the, the diary, I realized this is, it does sound like a very special kind of place. And it's also, uh, so far south, it's got this uh, Antarctic element as well. And as I said, I, I've done tropical collecting, but this idea of temperate uh, collecting in the southern hemisphere was very intriguing. And I knew that he was finding interesting things there. So it was kind of going back, taking the clues from his diary and going back to see what we could do there. So it, it is a, it, it's a combination of, of things. It's also been written about quite a lot. You know, it's the uh, kind of the end of the earth. Uh, it's about as far as you can go uh, in civilization in South America. Uh, so there's a, an allure to it. There's also this sense that uh, it was such a hub of activity in the, the days when the Straits of Magellan were the, uh, was the primary way that people would get from ocean to ocean. Uh, so I was intrigued by, by that. By reading about you know, Bruce Chatwin in Patagonia uh, is also partly set there and, and has connections. And it, it was a sense of adventure, in a way, to get to the end of the earth.